Let's go over some concepts that will be important for understanding cardiorespiratory endurance and how to train for it. So just a basic definition is how efficient is the cardiovascular system and respiratory system when they're working together. So when they're working in unison to help get oxygen out to the tissue, if you have one that is lacking, you're not going to have very much cardiorespiratory endurance, or maybe both are lacking. You want to try to boost both at the same time. By doing aerobic training, you can do that. You can improve the cardiovascular system's ability to get blood to the tissue and the respiratory system's efficiency at getting oxygen into the blood. If either one of those are lacking, you're probably not going to have very good cardiorespiratory endurance. So types of training, be considered aerobic, something that's continuous, repetitive, over a long period of time, or a longer period of time, greater than five minutes is what we're shooting for. And group fitness activities, like cardio kickboxing would be an example. Aerobic training, step training, anything that's continuous and repetitive. Now, it doesn't have to be steady state, meaning I don't have to just run at a steady pace or keep heart rate steady. Actually, the best way to improve cardiorespiratory endurance is to do interval training. A lot of different methods. There's the fartlek method, meaning train how you feel, or I think it's translated to speed play. But pretty much what it means is you train, keep a high heart rate until you just can't take it anymore, and then you drop down and keep a lower heart rate until you feel like you've recovered and you keep doing that. There's timed intervals where you go for a certain period of time at a high heart rate, and then you drop down to a lower heart rate to recover trying to improve that recovery heart rate in between those two. And that's really beneficial for running. Even for running marathons, it's been shown to try to keep a higher heart rate or keep a higher pace for a short period of time and then drop down and cool down. And individuals that do that tend to run faster times for their mile pace for a marathon. So those multiple miles in a row, they tend to do each mile faster than somebody running at a steady state. So getting a fit heart, obviously that's the pump of the cardiovascular system. We definitely want to increase the fitness of that pump and how well it works. Individuals that do a lot of cardiorespiratory training will have increased left ventricle size because that's the muscle or the part of the heart that pumps blood out to the rest of the body. So you'll see an increased size hypertrophy of the left ventricle. A fit heart will fill up with more blood per beat. That's your stroke volume. It'll pump more blood per beat. So your cardiac output will go up because as you start to work out, heart rate will increase. Stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that fills up the heart, will increase. Therefore, your cardiac output will increase. So this is a term, especially if you're going to be in exercise phys, you're going to see over and over. Pretty simple math. Heart rate times stroke volume will equal your cardiac output. A fit heart will have greater stroke volume. Therefore, it'll pump more blood per beat, so it doesn't have to beat as often. So that's why you'll see with athletes having really low resting heart rates. It's because they just have a, a really fit heart. Not only can it pump more blood per beat, it can fill up with more blood, so therefore it pumps more blood per beat. So on average, we're looking at heart rates for the average individual between 60 and 80 for a resting heart rate, but individuals that do a lot of cardiorespiratory training will have really low resting heart rates. Sometimes doctors might think they have an arrhythmia like bradycardia because it's so low. Like with me, when I had to teach three aerobic classes a day just because we had a, a lot of fitness classes and we didn't have enough teachers to go around. I would walk into the semester with an average heart rate in the 60s, resting heart rate. And then by the end of the semester, I'd be in the upper 40s just because I was receiving all that benefit from doing all that aerobic training. I would walk in at a weight of around 195 and I would leave this semester at 185 
and that that's really low for me because I'm around 6'1", 6'2", somewhere right around in there. All right, efficient lungs, gas transfer. How do we get that oxygen out to the tissue, right? Or how do we get it into the blood? So uptake of oxygen and getting rid of CO2 because we don't want acid levels to build up in the blood. So we need to get rid of that CO2, but we need oxygen. And that's going to happen in the lungs at the alveoli. They kind of look like clusters of grapes inside the lungs. And they have capillaries that surround them. And that's where the transfer of oxygen and the dumping off of CO2 is going to happen. So you breathe in, oxygen is transferred to the blood, blood through the capillaries on the outside of the alveoli. That gas transfer happens there. And then CO2 is dumped off and then you breathe it out to the environment. This is one of my favorite photos because now we're talking about macronutrients. How do we use fuel as a source of energy? And we kind of talked about this in the muscle endurance video, but we didn't really go in to depth. We kind of just kind of graze the surface. So let's talk about it a little bit more because it's more important here, um, especially when we're talking about fuel that is beneficial for um, cardiorespiratory endurance training. And then this could be important for muscle strength, muscle endurance, but it's especially important for cardiorespiratory endurance events, aerobic events. Our body for those events runs best off, car off carbohydrate. You could be on a ketogenic diet where you're taking in fats and proteins and get away with it with strength training. But you are not going to be at the elite level on a ketogenic diet trying to compete running a marathon. Just not going to happen. Your body runs most efficiently off carbohydrate, especially for those types of events. So glycolysis and more importantly, aerobic glycolysis, breaking down glucose and then converting that into a source where we can generate 36 to 38 ATP per molecule of glucose. That's going to happen in the aerobic oxidative energy system. If you try to do it with the other macronutrients, and that's what these are, fats, carbohydrates, proteins, those are our macronutrients. You probably hear people talking about macros these days. That's what they're referring to. You're not going to compete at an elite level running endurance events on a ketogenic diet. It's just not going to happen. So you may have heard of individuals carbo-loading a couple of days before a large aerobic event. And you may have heard the term fats burn in the carbohydrate flame. If you're going to be an exercise phys, you're probably going to hear that again. Because at that lower pace of these aerobic, long sustained aerobic events, especially like marathons or uh, Tough Mudder, you're going to have to use fats as a fuel source. So we talked about this a little bit in the last video on muscle endurance on how at those lower states, those lower contractile states that are using more slow twitch muscle, they were running off triglycerides. So if intensity is not too great, the body says, okay, let's burn some of these free fatty acids. So we break down the triglycerides into free fatty acids. We can use them as a fuel, but we're also using carbohydrate. Probably one of the best examples on the importance of carbohydrate that I can have you visualize is look at a marathon runner when they get towards the end of the race and they run out of carbohydrate and they start having to run off fuel or fat as a fuel source and look at how lethargic they get. They can still move but their pace slows dramatically because we needed this carbohydrate in order to help burn the fats as a fuel source. And when that goes away, we get really inefficient at burning fats and protein as an energy source. It can happen, but you're not going to be up there at that elite level when you hit the wall. 
And that's what it's called, hitting the wall. When you use up all your carbohydrates, you're going to hit the wall in these long, sustained aerobic events. And you're not going to be able to generate the ATP you need. You're going to have to slow down, and you may even have to stop. But I encourage you to go watch some videos. Go to YouTube, type in hitting the wall, and watch some of these events where somebody uses up all their carbohydrate. That will bring that point home to you on how important complex carbohydrates are when it comes to glycogen reserves and burning glucose as an energy source for aerobic events. I like this diagram as well because not only is this previous diagram showing how fats can be used as a fuel source important, but looking at the energy systems and how they work together no matter what event. So if you're going faster, like sprinting, you're going to use the the ATP CP system for the first 10, 12 seconds, you're going to max out around 20 seconds. If it's a slower pace, a moderate pace, anaerobic glycolysis will kick in and then that will generate your energy needs up to about two minutes and then you're going to have to either slow down, go at a slower pace or stop. If it's sustained over two minutes, really greater than five, so somewhere in that range, depending on intensity, the aerobic oxidative energy system will have time to kick in. But you're going to have to go slower, but you're going to generate more ATP through aerobic oxidative energy systems. I like this visual diagram because it shows you how the energy systems work together. Even for aerobic sports, you're going to run off the immediate source of ATP to get you going. Then you're going to have to use anaerobic glycolysis until aerobic glycolysis can kick in and the aerobic oxidative energy system can process and make ATP through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So there's some processes going on that we're not going to get into right now, but in a nutshell, that's how it works. So byproducts of cellular respiration, when we go through the Krebs cycle and we go out through the electron transport chain, you're going to create a lot of CO2, which you got to get rid of, so you have to expire it. That's another reason breathing rate goes up, is to get rid of some, some of this CO2 to blow that off. You're going to sweat. It's going to get rid of some of the water production, and that's good because we're going to generate metabolic heat. And all that H2O, when those hydrogen ions are created and then they bind with oxygen, we're going to produce water. That's going to help us sweat and get rid of some of the heat and get rid of acidity. Two methods of getting rid of byproducts that could create acidity in our body. Macronutrients, we just talked about hitting the wall. That's important that you carbo load before aerobic events. Carbohydrates, extremely important. Yes, you can run off fats as an energy system, but they require more oxygen. That's the reason you're going to have to slow down. And that's why aerobic, elite level aerobic athletes prefer carbohydrates as an energy source. Just because fats in the process of beta oxidation and breaking those down require more oxygen. Intensity. Intensity is extremely important. And we talked a little bit about that, having to slow down to use fats in that fat burning zone. But if you got on a treadmill, you may see in some of these modern treadmills where they say fat burning zone and they give you a heart rate for it. That's just saying that you're going at a lower intensity so the body has time to tap into trig triglycerides, break those down into free fatty acids and use them as an energy source. When you go really intense, really fast, your body doesn't have time to break those down, and so you're running off a greater percentage of carbohydrate. And this is just a rough estimate, just to give you a visual. Let's say we get on, we start sprinting. Body doesn't have time to run and break down fats as a fuel source, so we immediately go to blood glucose and carbohydrate and use that. So let's just say 75% of the calories that are being burned are coming from carbs the other 25% from fat. But when we walk, 
such a slow intensity or a low intensity that the body has time to go and break down those free fatty acids and there's not a big demand for oxygen we're going at a lower pace so we have time to break down fats so the opposite happens and these are rough percentages these are not exact I'm just trying to allow you to visualize what I'm talking about so at a walking pace let's say 75 percent of the calories you're burning while walking are coming from fat and the other 25 from carbohydrates. So that's what they're talking about on these fat burning zones versus carbohydrate burning zones. If you ever see it, don't get confused. And it's going to vary by individual based on how much lean muscle mass they have, how much glycogen stores they have, all that factors in. But that's really what they're referring to. What you should be concerned about is total calories being burned. doesn't matter the intensity. Whichever one's going to allow you to burn the most calories is probably going to be, you know, the fastest is going to be what most people are looking for. But maybe you don't have that fitness level, then you may have to go longer if you're in that fat burning zone to burn the same amount of calories just because the intensity isn't as great. So be more concerned about intensity than fuel source. And it all depends on your fitness, right? If you can maintain a higher intensity, then you're going to burn more calories than somebody that's walking, going at a slower intensity. It doesn't matter what the fuel source is. Ketogenic diets, we talked about that when we were talking about macro, macronutrients. You know, originally, um, what made these popular was the Atkins diet. And Dr. Atkins developed the diet because he had patients that couldn't work out, could not do cardiovascular training for a risk of um, causing them to go into cardiac arrest. So he had protein and fats as their major macronutrients that they were taking in. They limited the carbs and they noticed that these individuals were dropping weight there are some side effects some people do better on a ketogenic diet than others if you can't work out you can't maintain an intensity and you're not training for elite level aerobic sports i'm not going to say it's bad i'm not going to say it's good i don't promote it either way if it works for you it works for you but that was the original intention and then it made its way out into mainstream and they started noticing they could make money selling these Atkins products. And that really promoted the ketogenic diet. It does work. But what are the long-term effects? We just don't know. We really haven't studied it. And some people will argue that it was the preferred diet of our ancestors. There's no documentation to prove that. There's no long-term studies to see what the impact's going to be. And until that happens... I would take any information that you get from a source that could be sold and marketed, take it with a grain of salt because we just don't know. So if you're doing a ketogenic diet and it's working for you, great, document some of this. Even though that's an individual case study, there's always individual variation and if it works for you, it works for you. But just be aware, you could develop issues down the road. All right, VO2 max, this, I know it just says VO2, but let's talk about VO2 max for just a second. Extremely important for cardiovascular events. Um, if you're going to do this type of training, you're going to compete at an elite level, you need to understand VO2 max and how to improve it. So the average person, the average VO2, male, uh, VO2 max for a male is 35 mL per per kg per minute. The average for a female is 32 mLs per kg per minute. What does that mean? It means we're getting 35 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute out to the tissue. How efficient are you at using oxygen or delivering oxygen to the tissue? That's all that means. So that's a combination of the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system working together. It is a measure of your cardiorespiratory endurance. Uh, for somebody like Lance Armstrong, I think he had 88 mLs per kg per minute, but obviously he was doing some things he shouldn't be doing. 
highest ever recorded VO2 max at one time was 92 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute by a cross-country skier. Your top athletes are going to be at the top. Now, that may have changed, but I'm just saying a few years ago, that was the top. If you Google it, it, you may find some people at 96. I think I've seen 96, but it wasn't documented correctly, so I don't think it's widely accepted. But you'll see runners up there. You'll see cyclists at a really high level. You'll see cross-country skiers because they're working at, not only are they doing full body aerobic training, but they're working out at altitude, so that's why they get a lot of benefit. Uh, those two are extremely important. High altitude training is really important for improving VO2 max. But for most of us, even if you do a lot of cardio, you're probably somewhere in the 50s and 60s, but elite level people can get up in the 90s. O2 deficit. Anytime you start working out, the anaerobic system has to supply your energy needs. For a short period of time, we create some oxygen debt until the aerobic system has time to kick in. Let's go back to this slide. So we're using these energy systems anaerobically for a short period of time to get us going. And it takes a while for the aerobic system to kick in. Once it does, then we can start to replenish and make up for that oxygen debt. So if you ever hear of O2 debt, and some of that's due to heart rate lag, so like right when you start working out, you're not going to see an immediate change in your heart rate right off the bat, right off the start, because it takes a while. So you start delivering oxygen out to the tissue. It takes a little bit for there, a little bit of time for O2 debt to occur. Not enough oxygen gets back to the heart, and then it starts to beat. Uh, speed up because it's not getting as much oxygen back to it but that takes time for that to happen. Anaerobic threshold versus lactate threshold. A lot of people get these confused. They are different. So the anaerobic thresh threshold, like when you first start working out, you get really high heart rates. There may be a point at which, and this varies for everybody, let's just say we're training and I got a heart rate of 150. As long as I stay under 150, the aerobic system can supply all my energy needs and no, very little lactic acid will build up and I can buffer that lactic acid when it does. And this is how people get it confused because they are related, but they are different. But once I go above 150, let's say anything above 150 for me, let's just pretend, is my anaerobic threshold. Now I've gotten to an intensity, let's say I'm up at 160, 170, can't supply enough oxygen out to the tissue, lactic acid starts to build up because I start becoming more anaerobic. Well, that point at which I went above that 150 was my anaerobic threshold. The point at which lactic acid started to build up to a certain level is gonna be my lactate threshold. And you get to a certain millimole um, per deciliter in your blood of lactic acid and that would be lactate threshold the point that it starts to build up I can't buffer it anymore the point that the anaerobic or the aerobic system can't supply the energy needs is anaerobic threshold the point that lactic acid builds up above a certain level is lactate threshold and that's all we're going to discuss we're not going to get into this really deep um, it varies for each person, but it's that intensity that lactic acid begins to exponentially increase. And that's, a, that's happening because I can't get enough oxygen out to the tissue. Therefore, lactic acid is building up and my buffering capacity cannot deal with the amount of lactic acid building up. But the anaerobic threshold is that point at which the anaerobic system has to kick in to help out the aerobic system. So I know that's clear as mud now, so, um, but I think it gives you a rough idea of how the two are different. This one here is the point at which the aerobic system cannot supply my energy needs, right? And the anaerobic system has to kick in. This one is the point 
after that has happened, that lactic acid has built up and starts to increase exponentially, and my body cannot deal with it. And I'm eventually going to have to stop if that happens. All right, metabolic equivalence. This is related to VO2 max. I'm not going to get real in-depth on it, but I want you to know how to practically apply it to your workouts. A lot of treadmills, if you get on them, will tell you what your METs are. And let's say you're at 10 METs. You take 10, multiply it by 3.5, so you're at 35 mLs per kg per minute. That would be the average VO2 max for the average male. So it can give you an estimate of your VO2 max at that point, or how close you are getting to VO2 max. So you can measure and get a rough idea real quickly. That's how you would apply it in a real life situation. Now obviously they use this in clinical settings and it is much more complicated than what I'm referring to, but how the average person can use it in their workout is if you're on a treadmill and you see METs, whatever that number is, multiply it by 3.5 and that gives you an estimate of your VO2 max. So you can use it to estimate the intensity that you're at and kind of get a rough idea of your VO2 max at that point. High altitude training. Extremely important for cardiorespiratory training because it's going to allow you to increase mitochondrial density faster than you can do it with just aerobic training at sea level. So it's really recovery, uh, how high altitude, that's where you're getting all the performance trainings. That's the reason like barometric tents work for people. So you should really train low, right? Or yeah, train low, live high. So that'll increase mitochondrial density in the cell. So the more mitochondria you have, the more aerobic you are. So mitochondrial density is where when we talk about like the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain and generating all those ATP those 36 to 38 ATP that's all happening within the mitochondria so the more mitochondria you have the more aerobic you are and that's why we see an increase in mitochondria You'll also see increases in red blood cell concentration. So more red blood cells means more oxygen out to the tissue. You'll see more capillary innervation throughout the tissue. Therefore, we can get more oxygen to the tissue. And barometric tents are a way to simulate the benefits of high altitude training. Yes, you can get some benefits from high altitude training. Um, that's what happens with these hypoxic masks that people put on. They get in the hypoxic conditions and they're training with less oxygen. But really where a lot of the performance enhancement comes from is recovery at how high altitude. So you may see athletes sleeping in a barometric tent. The altitude needs to be 9,000 feet or above to really maximize all your benefits but that's how barometric tents work. They're not working out in the barometric tent, they're recovering in the barometric tent. So really, yes, you can get some benefit from a high altitude training, but you could train at sea level and then go sleep in a barometric tent and improve just as much or get their recovery benefits from it. Red blood cells, they have hemoglobin. There are four binding sites for oxygen on the hemoglobin. And so the more efficient you are, the more of those four binding sites you can fill up with oxygen and get more oxygen out to the tissue. That's why red blood cells are important. That's the reason people blood dope is they'll take erythropoietin EPO to boost the red blood cells for aerobic sports. That's what got Lance Armstrong in, in trouble was blood doping. He had more oxygen carrying capacity, he could get more oxygen out to the tissue. But the, in the old days, I think back in the 70s before they got a hold of EPO, which was designed for individuals going through chemotherapy, not only does chemotherapy destroy 
the cancer cells that destroys healthy cells. It'll destroy red blood cells and make a person weak. Before they had access to EPO that could boost red blood cell concentration, individuals were taking out blood, concentrating their red blood cells, and then injecting it back in. But they came became really dangerous because the blood became viscous and thick like sludge and it was more likely for clots to form so individuals had a higher incidence of stroke really dangerous and now they have a drug that can do that for them still risky right by increasing red blood cell concentrations you create a thicker blood more viscous blood and increase the chance of strokes Mitochondrial density, we've killed this. Like I've already talked about it in the past slides, they are the aerobic powerhouse of the cell. That's where aerobic oxidation is taking place. If I had a diagram where I could show you the cytosol where anaerobic glycolysis is happening and then we look within the cytosol, we would see um, within the mitochondria is where aerobic glycolysis, where the Krebs cycle, where the electron transport chain, all of that is happening, or the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain is all happening within the mitochondria. But interval training, talked about that on a previous slide. It'll increase, it allows you to adapt to those higher heart rates and stay at them longer. It allows you to improve your VO2 max. It allows you to really deal with lactic acid when it builds up. It improves your buffering capacity. That's something that steady state aerobic training doesn't do as good of a job. Because when you get these really high heart rates and you get tr past your anaerobic threshold and you start getting close to your lactic acid threshold or lactate threshold, your body starts to produce more buffering or stores more sodium bicarbonate within the tissue so that you can buffer more uh, lactic acid and you become more efficient at getting getting rid of co2 you get more efficient at sweating and cooling your body but plus you're getting rid of all those excess hydrogen atoms because they're binding with the oxygen therefore they're producing water that water is 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 cooling you off but one of the biggest differences, not just in recovery heart rate, you do get that from interval training, but your body's ability to buffer lactic acid. So switching between those lower heart rates and those higher heart rates increases your recovery time and really boosts that buffering capacity. That's one of the biggest benefits from interval training. And most of your sport training revolves around some interval-based activity. Look at soccer. They run up and down the field. They sprint for a short distance. They get to recover for a little bit, and then they sprint back down. Look at basketball. They run down the court. They sprint down. Then they come back, right? It's stop and go, stop and go. Well, it's not necessarily stopping, but they're getting higher heart rates, then lower heart rates. Higher heart rates, then lower heart rates. No matter, well, I shouldn't say no matter what sport, but the majority of your team-based sports and your activity-based long-distance events, recovery, heart rate is extremely important. Interval training is extremely important so that you can deal with high heart rates and you can buffer lactic acid when it builds up and you recover faster from those exhaustive bouts of, it, of activity. Then you have muscle pumps. This is, this is one that your coaches probably told you to not stop running when you're out there doing, let's say you're running the track and all of a sudden you suddenly stop and you've got your hands on your knees and you're breathing hard and your coach is yelling at you, don't stop, at least keep walking. What they're trying to tell you is to keep those muscle pumps active. So during a proper cool down after an aerobic event, we want to make sure that we assist the heart and help get blood back to it. So here's a diagram of veins. They have a series of one-way valves. And when you keep walking around, the muscles will squeeze on these veins, forcing the blood in one direction because it can't go back down so that we can help fight gravity. If you suddenly stop, you lose the help from the muscle pumps. They're no longer squeezing on these veins, so the heart has to pump 
harder to get the blood back to it, to keep the pressure up on the arterial side to help out the venous side. And what can happen, especially if you're not acclimated to cardiorespiratory endurance training, not enough oxygen gets back to the brain because not enough blood's getting there because the heart's working so hard that you can get lightheaded and pass out. So if you keep walking around, these muscles, every time they contract, will squeeze on these vessels, on these veins. And then blood is forced up, but it can't drop back down because of the valves that are in veins, not arteries. And that will help the heart out and get blood back to it. So it can oxygenate it. On the arterial side, it's pumped out to the tissue and, the, and then that oxygen's dumped off at the tissue. And then it comes back through the venous side, back through the veins, inferior, superior vena cava, largest veins in the body. They dump blood back off in the right atria. Then it drops down to the right ventricle. Right ventricles, or when the ventricles contract, forces blood out to the lungs. The lungs oxygenate it. It comes back into the left atria, drops down to the left ventricle. Left ventricle contracts, pumps it out to the aorta, the largest artery in the body. And then the process starts all over again. So I know that's more information you need to know, but the muscle pump is an extremely vital part of that process when you're working out because your body is deprived of oxygen. So we've got to get all the blood back to the heart so it can get oxygenated and the muscle pumps help that out. All right, the scale for today is we're going to estimate our max heart rate. This is for a beginner. There are other methods to set up training zones, but if you were training a beginner, this is what you would do. If you were training yourself and you're not accustomed to cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory training, this is a method you would use for a beginner. We're, we're starting off with like baby steps. So let's just pretend you're a 20 year old person, 220 minus your age. So your estimated max heart rate is gonna be 200. I take that 200, I multiply it by 80%, it's gonna give me 160. That's my upper limit. A heart rate of 160 would be my upper limit. Then I'm gonna take that same estimated max heart rate. Remember for a 20 year old person, 220 minus your age, it was 200. Take that 200, multiply it by 0 0.70 or 70%, 140. So for a beginner, I'm gonna have them train in between 80 and 70% of their heart rate. So between 160 and 140. As long as they don't have any cardiorespiratory problems during the health history questionnaire and they look, you know, they can walk and hold a conversation, this is the method I'm going to use unless I see any other indicators that they have cardiorespiratory problems where they couldn't do it, like asthma. That would be a big concern. I would start them off much lower if they had any pre-existing conditions after they've been cleared by a doctor. So they're training at 160, they're training in between 140. A good thing to do, most of these heart rate monitors will do it for you, you can set your training zones. And so if I'm going along and I'm running, and I, I'm like, man, this is easy. And I'm holding a conversation with the person next to me and my heart rate monitor starts beeping, oh, I'm not going hard enough to get all the benefit I could be from this training, I need to speed up. Or if I'm running along, person next to me is trying to talk, I can't even hardly hold a conversation, heart rate monitor starts to beep, oh, I know I'm way above my training zone, I'm training too hard, I won't last very long, I need to come back and get within my training zone. That's how you should use it. You should use it to make sure that you are maximizing your aerobic training, that you're not training too hard and you're not going too easy, so that you're getting the full benefit from your training program.